Well, you're back. Did you try this example problem? Uh, well, I hope you did. And I hope that you realized that this was pretty easy because it should be. It should be very easy. And let me demonstrate why. So this problem said, what bromo-substituated compound is required to react with the following Gilman in order to form the following? And it gives me this molecule, and it makes me believe that I've got to do all kinds of things to it, but I don't, because the only thing that I need to do is take a look at the R group that's on the inside. I know this molecule is going to have to go on. I know that this piece will have to go on and replace the halogen. That's how these things work. So I need to look for an area that has a carbon double bond carbon. And I'm going to scan through, da, 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 and right here is my carbon double bond carbon. This is the piece that I'm adding on. So this piece needs to go <clears throat> off of there. And that needs to have a halogen instead. That's it, folks. That's all that I need to do. So what I'm going to do as I'm going to redraw, as you can kind of expect, I'm going to redraw my starting reagent. Here was my double bond. And now I'm going to take my eraser and I'm going to get rid of it. That's not an eraser. There we go. There's that. So that carbon was erased, this carbon was erased, those two carbons come from my Gilman, and folks, this bond that sticks out now, this is going to a carbon in the product, but it's not going to go to a carbon here, it's going to go to a halogen instead. So something like a bromine or an iodine, maybe a chlorine can go there as well, but those are the halogenated alkanes that I need to bring to the table. Now in this case, this is a ketone, because I see a carbon double bond O. And there's a carbon to the left and a carbon to the right. But, folks, that's all I need. This is the bromo-substituated compound. And it told me bromo, so that's why I put bromo there. That will react with that Gilman to give me the product that I see on the screen. That's all that they want you to do. In the beginning. In the beginning. That's all that they want you to do. All right, so let's take a look at another example. What bromo-substituated compound would be required to react with that Gilman that you see that they've wrote in order to form each of the following? All right, so what I would like for you to do here is just pause the video. I'm not going to start a new one. We're only three minutes into this. So just pause the video. Take a stab at A, B, and C and see what you come up with. Notice it just says, give me a brominated compound that would work, that would make this thing. That's all that it says. They're not giving you any other restrictions other than the fact, here is your Gilman. This is what you need to be using. So pause it. Write down the example problems for ABC. Try to answer them and then hit play. And then come back and we'll talk about working and solving these three problems. Okay, so maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I don't know. I'm just going to pretend that you did. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So give me the benefit of the doubt that I'm going to give you the right answers here. Okay, so here is set A. There is my molecule. i just redrawn it. That's all that I've done. And then up here in the Gilman, you see a CHCH2 piece. Okay, so this is the piece that I need to add on. I'm going to scour through this molecule, and I'm going to try to find this carbon double bond carbon. And I see it right there. So that means that this is the piece that was added on, which means that if they want me to come up with a brominated compound, I need to whoop, get rid of that double bond out of there. And this bond that goes to that carbon, I mean, I see that right here, right? Here's a carbon in the ring that points out that goes to what was a double bonded carbon. 
Well, that bond is now going to go to my bromine. So, folks, there you go. That is going to be the bromo substituated compound that needs to be reacted with that Gilman to give me that product. All right, so let's take a look at B. There's no difference here. I need you to understand that it looks a little complicated, and they did this on purpose, but we used the same decision-making process. There's no difference. All right, so what I need to do, I need to look for a carbon double bond carbon because that's the piece I'm adding on, right? That's what they told me. So here I see actually two, but this is only going to bring to the table one of those. It's going to bring one grouping of that, not two. So the one grouping that it's probably going to bring is that one there at the end. That's going to be the easiest to bring to the table. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to redraw my reagent, so or my product in this case. So there's a double bond, and there's another double bond. So I'm going to take my eraser. You ready for the sound effect? There you go. It erases. And that carbon that's involved here, that's going to a carbon of the double bond. All right, so that carbon here is going to go somewhere again, but this time it's to my halogen instead. And this is okay, folks. I mean, this halogen is attached to an sp2 carbon, and we said that Gilman's are okay with this. It's one of the reasons that we use them, because some of the other ways that we do this will not work. So this is the first time that we really have been okay with the idea of Vinlix and Aryls and everything else in between. All right, now for C. Uh, for C, it looks like the difference here is stereochemistry, right? I, I mean, if I compare this to B, I see a carbon, double bond, carbon. So down here on C, a carbon, double bond, carbon. The difference is that this is somewhat in the trans notation. They go in opposite directions. And then here we see a cis notation. But the good thing about Gilman's is that it keeps the stereochemistry. All right, so what that means is I'm going to redraw that starting, or again, product. And I know I'm going to have to add on a carbon double bond carbon. So my carbon double bond carbon, there it goes. And what goes on to that spot is going to be a bromine. Therefore, when that carbon double bond carbon comes on, that carbon double bond carbon will be in the same stereochemistry orientation as what I've just drawn. It keeps the stereochemistry of the compound. Okay, so something else that we've not really done with Gilman yet, uh, but we did do it with lithium and Grignard, is all of our other reactions. So we said that when we take a Gilman, so let's do CH3, CH2, parentheses, 2, copper, and lithium, and we react this with something, then we're going to get a product. And what we've done so far is reacted it with an alkyl halide. And we've underwent really pretty much a substitution reaction, right? So some of the reactions that we just talked about with alcohols, epoxide. And I'm using an epoxide because we also used an epoxide for the Grignard, right? I mean, this is one of the ways that we kind of talked about, hey, listen, this is a nucleophile, and it acts just like all the other nucleophiles that you've known in existence so far. Okay, well, there's no difference here versus Gilman either. So what happens in this particular type of reaction? You should already kind of pick up on what's going to happen. This CH3CH2 is regarded as a CH3CH2 with a negative on it. So what would happen if I took that nucleophile and I added it to this epoxide, what type of product would be formed? Well, let's kind of go back and think about epoxide reactions, and I think that you're going to be able to figure this out. This oxygen is in a love triangle with the two carbons. Okay, and the two carbons, they're, they're kind of getting angry with it. You know, they, they want oxygen to kind of pick up their mind on which one that he or she wants. So this love triangle is not working out for everybody. There's serious strain on that relationship, and that strain is going to open the epoxide ring. 
All right, well, that oxygen is electronegative, and it wants, and it wants, and it wants, and it wants, and it wants from the one to the left, and it wants from the one to the right, and it's going to suck, and it's going to pull, and it's going to pull, and it's going to do all of these things and make these two carbons partially positive. So this love triangle is going to break. I mean, this is not going to stay around forever. As you can imagine, it's not going to work, not for long-term purpose. So this love triangle, it's going to look at the carbon to the left and the carbon to the right, and it's going to go, both of you all are cray-cray. Okay, so one carbon is not any better than the other one. When this love triangle breaks, it's going to have to end it with one of those carbons. It's going to make sure that it ends it with the one that's not going to come after it. Again, no keying the cars, no sabotaging at the workplace, no harassing phone calls, killing the rabbits and putting them down into the pots. We're not going to do that. All right, that's for movie stuff. Not here, not in organic. So oxygen has to be really careful. Okay, well, it's oxygen, electronegative, negative, calls the buddy up. Hey, nucleophile, I heard you were in town. Yeah, well, why don't you come over and why don't you take one of these carbons and occupy that carbon so that way I can get out of this love triangle mess and I can kind of clean up my relationship status. But I need your help because I need you to distract one of those carbons when I do this. So this carbon goes, okay, yeah, I'll be right over. So this carbon decides to boink right there. And that negative carbon pairs up with that possibly positive carbon, or slightly positive at least. And that oxygen says, phew, okay, thank goodness. So away it goes, the electrons, and boing, uh, off the epoxide ring goes. Okay, so what we have now here is going to be a CH3 and a CH2, and that was from the Gilman piece. And that has just been attached to the carbon that's involved in the epoxide ring. And that now has broken open. And there's our CH2 on the right-hand side. And that oxygen has basically went over to that particular carbon. Now, in the beginning, you need to understand that this is an O negative. So you're probably going to add some type of acid, like in step number two. You're probably going to add some type of acid here, and that could be something like HCl. And that acid purpose is to protonate that negative oxygen when that epoxide ring opens up. We just do not want a negative O that's out there because it's not going to stay around that way for long. So we have to satisfy it, we have to make it happy, and we've got to give it that proton so that way it can form that alcohol. So these Gilmans contribute to nucleophiles and these nucleophiles act like they have always had in any of our reactions that we talked about in Organic 1 or any of those reactions that involve the nucleophiles that we talked about in the alcohol lectures. So everything is fair game, folks. That's the problem here. Everything is fair game. It was fair game with the Gilman. It was fair game with the Grignard. It was fair game with the lithium compound. It was fair game for any of them. They act like a traditional nucleophile does. And in any reaction that we've discussed, and once more, they are assuming that you remember all of those reactions from Orgo 1. If you did not, I'm sorry. That's just the way that it is. That's the way that they write this material because it all wraps up into one. But if you did not, it might just be a little bit tricky on your end, or you might have to crack open the book and go back and review a little bit more. But they act like nucleophiles with any other compound. All right, so now let's take a look at another example. Here's another problem. What alcohols are formed from the reaction of ethylene oxide with the following organocuprates? And then follow that by the addition of acid. Hmm. Okay, so A, B, and C, it looks like they give me the Gilmans. Okay, these are the Gilman reagents. That's what they're calling these organocuprates. Okay, whatever. It's the same stuff. This is what we've always been doing for the past few videos, right? The weird thing here is that they don't give me the structure of what it's reacting with. And the reason that they don't do that is because they give me the name of the structure that it's reacting with. And the reason they didn't give me the structure and they give me the name is because I should be able to take this name and go to the structure. 
and this is an epoxide. So ethylene in the epoxide world, because we've talked about how to name epoxides, if we didn't do it here in 252, we did it in 251, so that might require a little bit of digging. But ethylene oxide, oxide is my O, and ethylene is two carbon. So folks, there we go. There's the ethylene oxide. It's kind of what we used in our last example. So they want me to take these three Gilmans, and they want me to react the Gilman with that epoxide. And they want me to break that love triangle up, and they want me to draw the product that forms instead. All right, so these should hopefully be pretty easy. So if I take a look at the first one, the first Gilman that they give me is a CH3, CH2, CH2, and there's two of those with a copper lithium and they want me to react this with my epoxide. Now I'm not going to draw the hydrogens, okay? Those are understood to be there. I'll do them maybe for the first one, but it's going to be the same all the way through. So H2 to the left and H2 to the right. It's a very symmetrical epoxide. Think about reactions of epoxides. Back in the alcohol lectures, the same thing's going to happen here. They went easy with you though. The reason they went easy with you is because they gave you a symmetrical one. What if we had an unsymmetrical one? You better go back and review those. All right. Okay, so if we have this Gilman and there's my epoxide, I'm going to draw the epoxide and there's the love triangle. Not very stable. They're not going to get along. Oxygen's got to break up with one. Both of these carbons are crazy. So you want to kind of distract it, so that way you can leave on good terms. Well, that's the purpose of the Gilman. And in the Gilman, we are bringing in the R group, so that R group is going to swoop in. It doesn't really matter which side I add it to. So those are the three carbons in the Gilman. That oxygen now, pop, open goes the epoxide ring, and it swings out to this outside carbon. And then the directions did tell me you are protonating in the very last step. I mean, it specifically said that. And the reason is because that proton has to go there to make the alcohol. So it said, what alcohol is formed? Well, here is the alcohol that's formed, but let's say that they want the name. All right, longest carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five. So this is a pentane, but it's an alcohol. I know it's an alcohol. I see the OH group. So I erase the E, and I add on OL, pentanol. All right, well, what kind of pentanol is it? Well, that OH group, I need to number closest to that end. So that's going to be over here to the right. So carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5. And on carbon number 1, I have my alcohol group. So one pentanol is going to be the name of that structure. Okay, so hopefully this was okay with you. Hopefully this wasn't a big issue, but now let's go to number 2. So for part B, it says, oh, there's the R group. And I'm going to react this thing with my epoxide. Hmm. All right. Not a big deal. I've got CH3, CH, double bond, CH2, copper, lithium. And they want me to react this with the epoxide group, like that right there. Again, symmetrical. They're trying to make it easy. There you go. But what if it wasn't symmetrical? Did you go back and review them? Probably not. You haven't done them time. So let's kind of do one of those. I'll just put another carbon out here to the right. That's how we'll modify that epoxide. No big deal. So let's think about what happens in these types of reactions that involve unsymmetrical epoxides. So I'm going to start off with my epoxide. So here it is. There's my love triangle. My Gilman's going to bring something to the table. It's going to bring this piece. And it goes. 
So this oxygen is going to look at these two carbons, and it's going to go, I've got to break up with one. And there is a difference now. So I need to get rid of the cray-cray one. I need to get rid of the one that's kind of messed up in the head, that could go a little psycho on me. Which one is that going to be? Because that's the one I'm going to stick my buddy with. I mean, friends look out for other friends, right? That's how we do that. Okay, so that new incoming piece will look at the carbon to the left, and this is a primary carbon, and it will look at the carbon to the right, and this is a secondary carbon, and oxygen's going to say, listen, if you're going to come in, and if you're going to take one of these away from me and be a good friend about it when you do, I want you to take the one that's messed up in the head first. And that one is the most unstable one. And that most unstable one is the primary one. So this piece says, okay, well, that's what I'll do. All right, so a carbon comes in, and that has a double bond, and that has another carbon, and then that has another carbon on it. So there's the piece that, in, that came into that organic, into that epoxide. That oxygen says, phew, thank goodness, because now I can bink off that bond, and now I no longer have to deal with that crazy carbon. And now I'm kind of hanging out right here. But right now, if I'm kind of settling at this point, this is a negatively charged oxygen. We can't have that. We've got to satisfy it in some form or fashion. So we bring in a proton, and that proton just slaps onto the oxygen, and we create an alcohol. All right, so here is the structure of the alcohol that's formed from that reaction. So let's go through and let's name this because naming the structure is a little different than just drawing the structure and it really depends on what the question asks you to do. So they are relying on you that you understood how to name alcohols back in the day and that you also understood how to name molecules with different functional groups because here we have a double bond. We've got to put that into the name somehow, some form, some fashion. It's got to go in there. So we do what nomenclature tells us to do. You find the longest carbon chain. All right, well, that goes all the way across. One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six carbons all the way across. There they are. So I know that this is probably a hexane in some form or fashion. Well, here, I know it's not a hexane, though. It's a hexene because there is a double bond that is involved. So there's my ene group. Okay, well, where is that ene group? I've got to give that a number. But the problem is that alcohol is also there. So I also need an ending of an OL? Well, yeah, that's how we handle this. Well, that OL also has to have a number. I've got to tell you where the OH group is at. I've got to tell you where that double bond is at. So OH takes priority. That was a rule in Gen Chem 1. So OH takes priority, which means that a number closest to that end, and I forget about everything else. So carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6. So on carbon number 2... That's where my OH group is at. So therefore, with my all, I'm going to have to make sure that I put the two that's very obvious where that two goes in front of that OL. That way, when someone interprets this name, they can see that and go, oh, that OL's alcohol, and there's a two in front because that must mean the alcohol is on the second carbon. Ding, ding, there you go. That's exactly what you need for the name. But there's also an ing. There's a double bond. Where is that double bond? Okay, well, I have to start here. I give OH priority. I start at numbering to the right. So there's carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, and carbon 4. So on carbon 4, that is where my double bond is located, and that is my ene group. So 4-hexene-2-all. And sometimes people will leave out that extra E and call it 4-hexen-2-all, and that is also accepted. 
So either one of those folks is okay as far as the IUPAC is concerned. As far as I'm concerned, either one of those are going to be equivalent. So for hexene or for hexane. And honestly, they like hexane a little bit better. It looks a little bit better. It sounds a little bit better. So for hexane to all is going to be more preferred than the full-blown ene. Okay? All right, so now we got one more. And this one more C. And here we have this Gilman. And that Gilman is going to bring with it a ring structure that's delocalized with a CH2 that's hanging off of it. All right, so not a big deal. I mean, I'm going to do the same thing as I've done with the others. I'm going to have this ring structure. So here's our six-membered ring. There's the CH2 group. And I have two of those with a copper lithium. So that is my Gilman. And then I need to react this with an epoxide. And I'm just going to keep the, just the normal epoxide in this case. Okay, we did an unsymmetrical one last. We'll go back to symmetrical one here. All right, so the idea, the concept is the same. This epoxide ring, love triangle, very unstable, very unhappy. It needs to break open. It needs to go to normal. I, I, maybe love triangles work for some people. It doesn't work for epoxides, though. So this carbon or this carbon, the one to the left or the one to the right, it, it's got to be attacked, right? We've got to bring in something else other than that shared oxygen. So what are we bringing in? We are bringing in that CH2 group, and then off of that carbon is this six-membered ring. So I just targeted the left one again. Folks, you can put it on the right one. It doesn't matter. It's okay. It means the same thing. So don't freak out if you want to put it to the right. Put it to the right. It's all right. So this love triangle, boing, off that bond goes, and we are protonating that O with an OH. So there is the alcohol. All right, so there we go. There is the alcohol structure. Now, what do we name this? This is something that we really haven't played around with yet. And the reason is because we haven't really talked about how to name that kind of thing if it's off of a longer carbon chain. So this one I'm not going to name. I would not ask you to name this on a test right now. Uh, I would choose Blackboard questions that would not ask you to name these types of things. But you do need to get comfortable with the idea that we can name benzene rings like that off of these carbon chains. So that's going to be perfectly okay, but we just don't know how to do it yet. And that's because we haven't made it to the benzene reactions and the benzene chapters yet. So we can have things that are called benzyls and aryls and phenols, and all of that is to come. So slowly but surely, we'll get there, but we're just not there yet. All right, so here's another example problem. What are the products of the following reactions? Oh, so here they're giving me unsymmetrical ones. Okay, so, well, at least for A. For B, they go back to the same old boring epoxide where it's the same on both sides and it doesn't really matter which one you add them to. All right, so let's take a look at A first. And let's react that epoxide, which is unsymmetrical, to that Gilman. And then it looks like in step number two they're adding water. Okay, well, that's perfectly fine. Water is like HOH, and water can be my proton source. So basically what that's saying is that this is going to be the source that your proton is going to come from. We're not going to acidify it. We're going to add water, and that can protonate as well, just like acid can. And we can put a hydrogen onto those oxygens without an issue. All right, so I'm going to go back, clear this off, and let's start with our epoxide. All right, so we got a carbon and a carbon and an oxygen. There's my love triangle. And then off of this is a methyl group and a methyl group. All right, so my Gilman, I'm just going to write that up here at the top so we don't forget it. It's a CH3, CH, double bond, CH. All right, so there's a parenthesis 2 right there. So this is the piece that needs to get added on. And we have an epoxide that we want to react this with. So again, keep in mind, if this was a halogenated compound, that R group would go and replace that halogen. Wherever that halogen was, it would substitute for that. Not a big deal. 
Here, though, we don't have a halogenated compound. We have an epoxide. The epoxide is very reactive. It wants to break open. And that is a negative piece. That's a nucleophile. And it's going to come into this epoxide and says, I'm here to save the day. Which one you want to get rid of? Oxygen. So oxygen says, I want you to get rid of the cray-cray one because they're going to come after me if I don't. So not a problem. This R group says, OK, this carbon's primary. This one is tertiary. This one is not causing you any problems. So if you're going to break out with one of these and you want to get rid of the crazy one, I'm here to save the day, and that's the one that I'm going to attach to. So we get a carbon and then a double bond carbon and then another carbon because that's what was in the R group up here from the top. And then this oxygen to carbon bond boink, breaks open. There you go. And now we're going to add water in the second step, and the purpose is to get that water to form an OH group. If I want to name this alcohol, I can. Just like before, I've got competing groups here, but OH takes priority, and I find the longest carbon chain first. So the longest carbon chain looks like I can go straight across. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so I'm going to circle this. There is the six carbons in total. We'll use the rules for chemistry 251. And we'll say six carbons. So this is a hexane. Eh, wrong. So the A is erased. And we will put an E here for ene. And that double bond is going to happen at a number, a location. I've got to figure out what that number is going to be. Well, OH takes priority. So we also know that this is an all group. And because it takes priority, I'm going to number closest to that side. So carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, 4, 5, and 6. So in doing that, my 2 is where the alcohol group is. So 2 all. My 4 is where my double bond is. So I can call this 4 hexane. 2 all. And then at carbon number 2, I have a group that I did not include in the main chain, and that one carbon is called a methyl. So 2 methyl, 4 hexane, 2 all. Again, that is a review of alcohol nomenclature, and that alcohol nomenclature with that double bond nomenclature happened in Orgo 1. All right, I've got one more example. We'll finish this video up. And here's B, again, an epoxide. That epoxide's symmetrical. They give me a little bit of an idea of stereochemistry here, right? So that's pretty good. And then they say, you need to react this with the Gilman. There you go. Okay, so I need to react that with the Gilman. Not a big issue. There's no tricks up anybody's sleeve. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to start with the epoxide, which is a carbon carbon love triangle and then off of this carbon I have a carbon group and off of that carbon I have a carbon group. I'm not going to worry about the stereochemistry here and I'll tell you why in just a minute. I'm just going to draw the carbons there. No shaded bonds. Okay. I'm also leaving off the hydrogens too by the way. So I need to react this with a Gilman. Uh, what Gilman did they use? Well, they used a CH3 and a CH2. That's what was in parentheses with the Gilman. Okay, no big deal. That's my nucleophile. My nucleophile comes in, and it attacks one of these carbons in the epoxide. That ring needs to open up. So oxygen's going to look at the one to the left and look at the one to the right, and it's going to say both of them are as lousy. So I don't really care which one you go for. Just go for one of them. Just to shake things up a little bit, then I'm going to add this group onto the right-hand carbon to prove to you that we can do this without a problem. All right, so CH2CH3 is going to go there, and this oxygen says, phew, thank goodness. So, boink, off that bond goes, and then the water is going to come through and add on the H to protonate that negative oxygen group. So, folks, there you go. We've e broken up an epoxide ring. Epoxides are very reactive. These reactions happen very easy with them. That's why we do them, quite honestly, especially here in the beginning. And this R group acts just like a nucleophile always has in any other reaction that we've done. Once more, we need to find out the longest carbon chain. So the longest carbon chain here is one, two, three. If I go across, that's four. But if I go down, that could be five and six right in there. 
So there is my longest carbon chain. It's going to snake around. I'm going to number closest to the end with the OH group. And if I number to the left, that's the second carbon in. If I go from the right, that's going to be my fourth carbon in. So carbon 1 and carbon 2 and carbon 3 and carbon 4 and carbon 5. So because there's five carbons here, this is going to be a pentane. Well, it's not a pentane, though. I need to erase that E because this has only one functional group, and that's an OH. So this is an all pentanol. Carbon number two is where that OH group is going to be. So two pentanol. However, I'm leaving off a group. I can't forget about it, and that group's right there. So that one carbon group is called a methyl, and that happens at carbon number three. So three methyl, two pentanol. All right, folks, so there you go. There's the uh, answers to problem 9A and 9B. I hope that you feel pretty good about these so far. And when we come back, we're going to focus on a different type of problem. And this problem 10 says, how could the following compounds be prepared using cyclohexene as a starting material? So this is full-blown synthesis now. That's what this is. This is synthesizing a product. And they want to know, using cyclohexene as the starting point, Cyclo is a ring, hex is six, and ene means a double bond. So this is what I'm going to have to start with. They don't care what else you have to use. As long as it's something that we've talked about at this point, that's all that matters. This is anything out of Chem 251, and it's anything out of the alcohol reactions. I don't care. The problem doesn't care. Using cyclohexene, how could you make A, B, C, and D? Oh, tricky, isn't it? Let's just take a look at A really quick. Looks like the majority of cyclohexene's there. The double bond's broken. How do you break a double bond? Well, not only is the double bond broken... But there's an OH group on it. How do you put an OH group on? And there's also an extension, and that's a two-carbon chain. How do you extend a carbon chain? Folks, there's a couple of options out here for you. No one said this has to be done in one step either. This could be multi-step synthesis here. So this is where I'm stopping this video. And when we come back, we will tackle these questions because I almost guarantee you that you might be tricked up a little bit if you're not careful. So try them, see how far you can make with them, and then come back. And when you come back, you're going to be like, oh, I should have known that. I know, I do that too. So I'll see you next time, and we'll talk about these four synthesis steps.